Um, so the variation of the attribute among entities serves as the standard with which we recognize measurement. Now, um, there's three things that can there's three consequences that you can draw from this claim, and hopefully that was clear. First, the concept of isolated the concept of isolated measurement, right? If we talk about measurement by itself, sort of measurement um, by itself, what do we have? Well, measurement by itself, it only yields, it only gives a difference in the attribute. Right? If we're only talking about measurement by itself, then all we have is a difference in attribute. And that's fine. Right? Um, a lot of people only function on that level, in some sense, right? Um, your very basic, very basic physics account functions on this level. Um, what I want to do is measure the variation in the attribute of length. This is two meters. This is six meters. This is six feet. This is um, 12 feet. What have you, right? So we make, uh, on a very, very basic account, when I've only isolated measurement, then what I've done is I can only get from that information a variation in the attribute. Right? Length is varied by this degree, by this amount. When I talk about measurement and the attribute, when I talk about measurement um, and plus the attribute, what I have is the quantitative, right, the quantitative ability to assess the variation in the attribute. But not only the quantitative ability to assess the variation in the attribute, a conceptual, rudimentary conceptual understanding of how to do this. And how is it that I actually do this? What I have to recognize is I have to isolate the attribute. Isolate the attribute, the isolation of the attribute by itself. Um, what ends up happening, happening, what ends up happening when I isolate the attribute um, is that I arrive at the formation of the concept because the concept is devoid of what I've identified as attributive instantiation. That's a mouthful. What does that mean? Um, and I want to make this clear. We are talking about length here, but the idea of length has been instantiated, meaning that it's been, uh, for lack of a better term, embodied or brought into some uh, perceivable reality. Right? Length is instantiated in one length. Length is instantiated in two length. Length is instantiated in three length. If I want to arrive at the concept length, what I recognize is that when I'm talking about all three of these things, I'm talking about the distance, right? The, how, how long a thing is, you know, how, how, how far this thing extends. Well, in order to talk about how far this thing extends, I don't need to talk about any particular thing, right? I recognize that I can just leave it blank because I understand now. Once I understand, what I've done is I've removed the measurement from um, the particular uh, objects in the world. I've removed the measurements from the particular objects in the world and only looked at the attribute of those measurements. Right? So then you could attempt to describe what uh, length is scientifically. You could attempt to describe what a triangle is scientifically. She goes and she attempts to describe, and I think she does a pretty good job, of what um, uh, a table is in, in very technical definitional terms. Flat object supported by um, uh, um, structures, I forget exactly how she puts it, used to hold smaller objects, and so on and so on and so forth. So like she gives us a definition of a table, and what we recognize is in that definitional account, everything is essential. What ends up happening in academic thought is we, as academics, present our concepts and people challenge our, our description. Well, 
in your account, and she even does this in, in her account at the table, um, she specifies, just as an example, that there might be certain dimensions, but then she says, well, if it's too small, then it would be like a toy table or a miniature table. If it's too big, it would be like a prop table and, and so on and so forth, right? But you get the idea. What we do is we attempt to uh, limit and define the scope of the definition so that when we have just the attribute, right? When we have just the attribute, we create a scope, okay? and that scope that scope defines the essential essential characteristics of the right um, what we do is we isolate the attribute get rid of the particular instantiation of it in objects and limit the scope by triangle I mean essentially an enclosed three-sided geometric figure with interior angles totaling 180 degrees. Perfect, succinct, every word counts. Every word is essential to understanding the idea of what triangle is. Similarly, in, in order for Rowling um, to create the idea of mogul, she identifies in the world that she's created that there would be people who do not have an ability to practice magic. She recognized that that concept has meaning and significance insofar as her, her, uh, her series is about magic. So she then attributes a term to that concept. But we don't need to talk about any particular group of parents or any particular group of people who don't practice magic. We don't have to say that Mary doesn't practice magic or Tom doesn't practice magic. right? We recognize that the attribute, practicing magic, if we're talking about Mary who doesn't practice, or Tom who doesn't practice, or Steve who doesn't practice, none of those instantiations are rele relevant. We can get rid of all of the measurements and just look at the concept, just the attribute, practicing magic. We give a term to that, mogul, and now we just talk about muggling. It's exactly what is done. That is as simple as it gets, right? So what we do in the world is we identify things which look like triangles, we see what the essential qualities of these things are, we define those essential qualities, and then we name that definition. Then, instead of referring to the definition, we refer to the name for that definition. That's concept formation. Um, and then lastly, um, with intellectual development, as we grow, as we progress through life, the complexity of our knowledge and our range, slash scope, has the ability to grow. Right? So what we, we all need to recognize is that as we age, as we grow, and I don't mean an age just arbitrarily. I mean because there are people who are very, very old but are, who are willfully, blissfully ignorant. Right? All of this is buttressed on the assumption that you are a lifelong learner. You are a lifelong student. As I age, as I grow, I recognize that things that I used to look at as a child I can look at with increasingly more complexity as I get older. Quick side note. Um, in uh, education, there's an, uh, the concept of reader response, right? So I used to be a high school biology teacher, um, and I know that my students have a certain concept of, of not, they have a certain understanding of knowledge that they bring to the table. Imagine that you take your favorite book, Atlas Shrug, <laughs> since we're doing RAN, right? Um, imagine. I take the book Atlas Shrug. I read the book Atlas Shrug at 14 years old. I'm like, wow, this is a pretty cool story. It's, you know, sort of, uh, sort of dystopia, dystopic, you know, it's, 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 a, it's pretty hardcore. It's just, yeah, it's cool. It's a cool book. So then I move from 13 and I revisit the book when I'm 20. I've taken my first introduction to philosophy class. I've, I've just finished reading a bit of Rand on a conceptual level. I've read too much Berkeley. <laughs> And then I go back to Atlas Shrugged, and I'm like, wow, you know, I didn't get that in Atlas Shrugged before. I didn't really realize that, you know, that there were social implications for this narrative. 
then I grow up a little bit more and I become a, a, a professor of philosophy and I'm, I'm very, very uh, I'm well versed in the tradition of philosophy and I look back at Atlas Shrug and, and then I say, well, not only are there social implications, but there's epistemological implications here. And then, you know, as a professor now, I end up having professor friends, colleagues, and we talk on a very, very sort of critical level. And they give me ideas that I've never heard. And then I go back and I read it again, and I'm like, yet again, there's another level of complexity. The thing that this shows you is that insofar as we age, insofar as that we, we grow in knowledge, in our desire to learn more, we can increasingly revisit exactly the same things over and over and over and over and over again and flesh out more complexity. The, the greatest gift that a young academic can have is to go and revisit an idea which the academy has already said has been totally described or has been totally exhausted, revisit it with fresh eyes and give it a new interpretation. So in the field of philosophy, I have absolutely no interest in doing this, but for you philosophers that might actually watch this video um, um, in a series of videos, the mind-body problem has basically been you know, dis discarded. Philosophers don't primarily talk about the mind-body problem anymore. Why? Philosophers, and I tend to believe this, that, you know, the mind-body problems have been resolved, right? You're either an idealist or you're a physicalist, um, and there really isn't any overlap, right? The, the assumption that there's an immaterial mind in a material body has basically been unfounded. But if there's a young philosopher that has a new mode of interpretation and says, no, well, let's think about that. Is it really the case that the mind needs to be physical? Or is it really the case that the body becomes um, immaterial because everything refers back to me and this sort of um, Berkeleyan um, solipsism, if you will, then, then no. Um, that's the point, right? The point is revisiting things that we'd seen before with uh, fresh eyes. So, uh, as I said, Rand is a treasure trove of, of good philosophical gems. I think the, um, the importance of this chapter uh, so far, and I've only covered the first three pages of the chapter in this you know, hour and change video, is a recognition that um, what she's attempting to do is to give us the systematic process in which we arrive at concepts. In understanding in the simplest terms possible, how we arrive at concepts, her epistemology, her theory of knowledge, um, is justified in this world, like Aristotle, in this world. And insofar as she justifies her epistemology in this world, she, she offers a new uh, discourse in the tradition. So, with that being said, I hope you've enjoyed the video. Uh, I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell. I'm going to thank you for taking time to watch my videos. Goodbye.